Hello grade 10 students. Today I am going to discuss unit 6 of your science textbook. Structure and functions of the plant and animal cell. This is a biology unit. So by now you know when we say it's a biology unit, it's related to living organisms. If we look around us, there are many different types of living organisms, the plants, animals and us. And our body is a very, very complex structure because it does many different functions. And to carry out all these functions, there are different systems. In our body, there is a digestive system, an excretory system, a respiratory system and even the reproductive system. The same way plants also have different systems. They have the root and the shoot systems to do different functions. If we look closely at all these complex organisms, the systems are made up of organs and the organs are made up of tissues and we go into the basic structure of tissues we find that all living organisms are made up of the smallest unit called cells and these cells differ from plant to animal that is why we need to discuss the plant and animal cells differently let us first see what the content of the lesson is. The basic unit of life. So under this we will be discussing about cells. Concept of the cell. Structure of the cells. Cell organelles and structures present in a cell. So although we say cell is the smallest unit, that also has structures and organelles within it. Cell growth and cell division. So let us start the lesson with basic unit of life. Basic unit of life. In 1665, Robert Hooke observed a section of a cork using a microscope prepared by him. He discovered a structure like chambers in a beehive and he named them as cell. So as you know, scientists do research on different things. And Robert Hooke was observing different tissues from different plants. And when he did that, he used his own microscope. You can see the picture of his microscope. When he looked at a plant part through that, he saw structures like this. In this, there were polygonal shaped structures which were repeated and which were similar to each other. So, it actually resembled a bee hive. Then he understood that all the organisms are made up of simple basic units which look like those beehive structures and he named it as cells. So Robert Hooke, he is the person, the scientist who identified cells first. After him, there were other scientists who observed many other tissues from plants as well as animals. And from their observations, they came to the conclusion as to how organisms are made. And from that, they proposed the cell theory. The cell theory was introduced based on the facts revealed by observing different live tissues. So here you have to remember students, they observed live tissues say a part of a plant, a part of a microorganism, 
actually a full microorganism or a specimen. So they were all live tissues and from that they proposed the cell theory and to propose the cell theory there were three scientists involved in the process and they are Schleden Schwann and Radolf Virchow. So Schleden, Schwann and Radolf Virchow are the three scientists who proposed cell theory. This cell theory has certain contents in it. Let us discuss the contents. The contents of the cell theory are as follows. There are three contents. The first one is the structural and functional unit of life is the cell. So that is the first one. Structural and functional unit of life is the cell. So that means it's common to all living organisms and also if you take the structure of the living organisms they are the basic unit. And if you take the functional unit, again the cell is the basic unit. Because there are some organisms that are made up of one cell. So both the structure is one cell and all the functions are done by that one cell. So therefore it's the structural and functional unit. The second content is that all living organisms are made up of one or more cells. So that is why we call organisms as unicellular, that is one cell and multicellular, more than one or many cells. So the second content of the cell theory is that all organisms are made up of one or more cells. So when we say more than one cells, all organisms start with one cell but they grow. Now even a child, the size is small but when the child becomes an adult, the child grows in size, height and weight. The same way a plant starts with a seed. That's a very tiny substance. So from the seed, a large tree grows. That means the number of cells increase when organisms grow. So for this to happen, the existing cells have to divide and form new cells. So that is the third content of the cell theory. New cells are formed from pre-existing cells. So new cells are formed from pre-existing cells. So students, you have to remember that Robert Hooke is the scientist who identified the cell and Schleden, Schwann and Radolf Virchow proposed the cell theory. With that in mind, let us discuss the cell concept. 
concept of the cell. So when we say concept of the cell, the cell is the smallest structural unit of organization of the living body. When I introduced the lesson, I told you all we are all very complex organisms. And our body, when you look at the organizational levels, it has different levels which are more complex. But when you go to the smallest simple unit, that is the cell. So that is why we call it the smallest structural unit of organization. And under this, based on the number of cells present in a living organism, living organisms are divided into two main types. The unicellular organisms. I'm sure you know many examples for unicellular organisms. You have learned about microorganisms. The bacteria, fungus, these are all microorganisms that have only one cell as their body. So therefore, they are the unicellular organisms. So as examples, we can take bacteria, fungus, under fungus we can talk about many different fungi, different types of bacteria which are unicellular. At the same time, there are many organisms which are made up of more than one cells. Those are the multicellular organisms. And as examples for multicellular organism, we can consider plants and animals, including us. So multicellular organisms are plants, animals and men. If you look at the functions of these organisms, now we all know we grow, we respire, we eat food, the food undergoes digestion, then there is the process of excretion, reproduction. Does a microorganism do all these? Yes, just one cell performs all these functions. But when the complexity increases, the way the function is carried out will vary. But even in multicellular organisms, there are single cells that perform specific functions. Let us look at some examples. Cells perform different functions in the body. If we take the RBC, this is present in blood, the red blood cell. This is one cell that can transport oxygen. So all the red blood cells or the RBC present in blood, the function is they transport oxygen. So here they have a certain function, transport of oxygen. If we take the WBC, that is the white blood cell present in again blood. This is involved in antibody production or phagocytosis. That is to prevent pathogens from affecting the body or helps to protect our body from pathogens. That is another example. Similarly, we can take the nervous system of our body. The nervous system is made up of nerve cells. Now nerve cells. Another name given for nerve cells is neuron. Now these neurons are the basic structural units which transmit nerve impulse. As I am talking to you all, 
you can hear my voice. The sound is received by the ear and the information is taken to the brain in the form of nerve impulse. So that is done by neurons or nerve cells. So transmission of of nerve impulse. So as you can see students, even in a multicellular organism, there are single cells that are adapted or that are present in the body to carry out specific functions. And these functions differ from cell to cell. What is done by the RBC cannot be done by the neuron. And transmission of nerve impulse cannot be done by an RBC. So each type of cell has a different and specific function. So the smallest bio unit, because it is in the living organism, we say bio unit. The smallest bio unit that is adapted to perform a particular function is the cell. So here we have looked at some examples. So the structural and functional unit of life is the cell. Both the structural and functional unit. So this is the first content of the cell theory. The structure of cells. The cells differ from one another in their shape, size and function. Now we talked about RBC. This is a circular shaped cell. If you look at it from the side, it is a biconcave disc-like structure. So if we take the RBC, if you look from the top, it's a circular disc. And if you look from the side, it looks like a biconcave disc. The same way if we take a neuron or a nerve cell, it has a slightly more complex structure. It has different parts to the cell. So that has a different shape. So their shape, size, and function all are different from cell to cell and mostly cells are not visible to the naked eye. You all know some examples like yeast it's a unicellular organism but it's visible to the naked eye. Still we can't see the proper structure of the cell. But the cells present in our body are not visible to the naked eye. So if we want to observe the cell, what do we do? We use a light microscope. Therefore, they must be observed using the light microscope. So when you look at a cell through a light microscope, you can identify the different shapes and the sizes and also you will see all the structures that are present within the cell. We will be discussing these structures in detail but the structures that are present inside the cell to perform various functions are known as the organelles. So when we look at a cell through the light microscope, we may not be able to observe all the organelles, but we'll be able to see some of the organelles. To do this, we will have to prepare a slide. When we observe specimens through light microscopes, you can prepare a slide which will be a temporary slide or we can use the slides that have been already prepared. That is known as a 
permanent slide. Now let us discuss how we can prepare a temporary slide to observe different types of cells. So the activity study of animal cells. So when we say animal cells, we also belong to the same category. So therefore, we use cheek cells to observe animal cells. If we look at the materials needed for this activity, we need a sample of cheek cells. So that is the first material, a sample of cheek cells. It's very easy to obtain a sample of cheek cells. You have to wash your mouth first with clean water and then you need to use a very clean yogurt spoon. And using the yogurt spoon, you can scrape out a small amount of the cheek cell sample. Then to prepare this temporary slide, we will need a clean glass slide. So we need a clean glass slide. And what do we do? On a clean glass slide, we put a drop of water. So for that, we will need water. And on that, we use the yogurt spoon to spread the cheek sample. Once that is done, we need to cover the sample using a cover slip. So here we will need a cover slip. With that, our temporary slide is ready. Then we use a compound light microscope to observe the slide that we prepared. So here we will need a compound light microscope. So let me summarize the steps of this activity again for you all. The method, wash the mouth and scrape the inner side of the cheek using a yogurt spoon. So that is to obtain the sample. Obtain a clean glass slide, put a drop of water, transfer the specimen onto the slide. So this is a very simple procedure. You have prepared temporary slides before. So this is how we prepare using the cheek cells. Cover the specimen using a cover slip without trapping any air bubbles. That is the most important thing. Because if air bubbles get trapped inside, when we observe the specimen, we wouldn't know whether we are looking at the cell or the air bubble that is trapped. So we should make sure that there are no air bubbles trapped. To do that, when you have the glass slide, you hold the cover slip slantly on top of the glass slide and slowly place it on the specimen so that air bubbles don't get trapped. And finally, when the slide is ready, we observe it through the light microscope. So it's a very simple activity. Let us observe the cheek cells under the light microscope now. Okay students, now let us do this activity to observe the cheek cells of a person. For this, we will need a light microscope. As you know, this is a compound light microscope because it has two lenses, the objective and the eyepiece. Through that, you can clearly observe the cells of a specimen. And to prepare the sample or the specimen, we need to take cheek cells that you already know with a very clean washed yogurt spoon, we scrape out a part of the cheek from inside. It's not that we really 
remove a huge part, just light scraping will give us some tissues. So that will be spread on a slide. As you know, always to prepare a sample or a, a specimen to observe under the light microscope, we have to use a glass slide. This is something that's familiar to you and on this glass slide, we need to put a drop of water using a brush like this. We will put a drop of water and onto that, we will have to spread the cheek cell as a smear. Just spread it on the glass slide and this you know is a smaller thinner piece of glass which is known as the cover slip. We have to place the cover slip on top of the sample. So here when we place the cover slip we don't just put it on top. If we do that there can be air bubbles trapped inside the sample. So therefore we have to hold it at an angle and place it on the sample. I have already prepared this slide using a student's cheek cell sample. So I have a temporary slide mount of the cheek cell here. Now we will observe it under the light microscope. So as you know students, when we are using the light microscope, we have to place the sample on the stage. Here you can see I will place it on the stage and we have to adjust the sample so that it comes in line with the part where we have the light falling on it, where the lenses are so that we can observe it clearly. Then I have to observe the sample using the lowest power. Lowest power can be easily identified that has the shortest tube and I have already selected the lowest power and for that the adjustment is done using the coarse adjustment knob. So while I place my eyes and observe the specimen through the eyepieces, I can move the coarse adjustment and observe the specimen in the slide. So now I'm going to do the adjustment. I'm going to move the coarse adjustment knob so that the uh, lens moves. As you can see, I will first bring it down and then I will move it upwards. So now when I move it upwards, you can see, if you can't see clearly, you might have to move it down again. And then when you watch, you can see the cheek cells in that specimen. You can see circular shapes, different sizes but circular shaped cells in that sample. Once you observe that, we can change the power of the lens to a higher power. I will do that now and then with the high power, we don't use the coarse adjustment knob. What is the knob we are supposed to use? Yes, it is the fine adjustment knob. By adjusting the fine adjustment knob, we can clearly observe the cells present in a specimen of the cheek. So we will be observing the cheek cells. So when I observe through the eyepiece again and move the fine adjustment. Now I can clearly see the cheek cells. They have a spherical shape. Almost all the cells look the same and they have a spherical shape. You can see the outline of the cells very clearly. So students, from this sample, the sample that was obtained from a student's cheek, the inner part of the cheek, we observe the cheek cells. They all look similar and they look spherical in shape. You can see the outline of the shape uh, cells very clearly. So that is the first activity we do the, for this lesson to observe animal tissues or tissues present in a person's cheek. And from that you were able to see 
that the cells were spherical in shape and the outer border can be seen clearly. And inside, sometimes we might be able to observe the nucleus. But in this, you were able to clearly observe the shape of the cell and the similarity between the cells of the tissue. So students, now you have got a good observation through the light microscope as to how cheek cells look like. Okay students, now you saw how cheek cells look like under the light microscope. You all saw the observations clearly and you can remember the shape of the cells. How did they look like? They were somewhat like oval shaped cells. So here the cheek cells look oval in shape like this. And in those cells you can see a clear boundary. This is the membrane of the cell. We call this the cell membrane. And in the middle of all the cells, you all were able to observe a dark black color spot. That is the nucleus of the cell. So you were able to observe the nucleus of the cell. These are the structures or the organelles present in a cell. And these are the structures that we can observe through the light microscope. And between the nucleus and the rest of the cell within the cell membrane, this area is made up of a gelatinous structure. You were able to see it like a pinkish color area. That is the cytoplasm. So these are the three parts of the animal cell that you can observe through the light microscope. The cell membrane, nucleus and the cytoplasm. Now let us do another activity to observe a plant cell. Study of plant cells. For this we will be using onion peel cells. So as materials we will need to use an onion. That is the sample or the specimen. So from this you have to remove the dried scaly skin of the onions then we need to peel out a fleshy part and from the fleshy part of the onion we cut out very thin specimens. So that is what we will be observing under the microscope. Then as I said we take samples we need to put it into a uh, maybe a watch glass or a petri dish containing water. So here we will be using a watch glass. So here I will need a watch glass. And after we get very thin peels of the onion peel, we have put it into water. Then we take a clean glass slide. And on this clean glass slide, we have to put a drop of water. And on that, using this paintbrush, we transfer a thin peel from the sample. So to do that, we will need a paintbrush. And once we have the correct sample or the sample that we think is very thin and ideal on the drop of water on a glass slide, we need to cover it using a cover slip. 
I have already told you all what is the important thing when we cover it with a cover slip. Yes, we have to make sure that there are no air bubbles trapped inside. So once we do that, our slide is ready for observation. And we observe this using the compound light microscope. So here we use the compound light microscope. So as I said students, we also need water for this activity. So here you can see there is water. So now let me summarize the method of this activity. Cut an onion and obtain an inner fleshy tissue. So here the inner fleshy tissue is what we will observe. Remove a peel from inner or outer surface. So peel is the very thin part, a thin layer which we peel out from the onion, fleshy part. So it can be from the inner surface or the outer surface. Both will look the same. Transfer it onto a watch glass containing water. Why do we need to put it in water? So that the sample does not dry. It will be fresh when we observe it under the microscope. Put a water drop onto a clean glass slide. We have to always make sure we use clean slides. Transfer the specimen onto the slide using a paint brush. Cover it with a cover slip without trapping any air bubbles. Again, this is an important consideration. Without trapping any air bubbles, to do that, as I said before, you hold the glass slide horizontally like this and onto that we keep the cover slip slantly and just place it slowly on the specimen so that air bubbles do not enter into the specimen. Once we do that, the slide will be ready for observation. So observe it using the light microscope. This again is a very simple activity. Let us observe the onion peel in the lab. Okay students, now let us do this activity. What are we going to prepare now? Yes, we are going to prepare a temporary slide mount of a plant tissue. So for this, I have chosen the onion. So we'll be taking onion peels and using that we will make slides and we will observe that slide in a light compound microscope. So as you know already to prepare a temporary slide we will need a clean glass slide and a cover slip and also to cut and take out very thin onion peels I will need a sharp blade an onion as, as the sample or the specimen and also to initially transfer the small cut out onion peels into water. I have a watch glass with water in it and to transfer the specimen from water onto the glass light I will be using the brush. So first I will take out a piece of onion and from that I will cut out a few tiny peels from it. So here we can peel out very thin peels and put it into water. First I will put it into water. It's better if you can take out more than one peels so that you can select the thinnest one from the out of all the peeled out parts. So now I have three peels out of that I will select one of the peels which is more clear I think this should do 
So first I'll have to put a drop of water on the glass slide and onto that using the brush I will transfer this peel. I will have to take out this peel. Now I will have to transfer the onion peel onto the glass slide. So now I have kept the peel on the glass slide. Then I will take this cover slip. As you already know, we can't just put it on the specimen. Then air bubbles can get trapped. So because of that, I hold the glass slip straight and the cover slip at an angle to the specimen and slowly place it on top of the sample. So now I have my glass slide ready to observe. Then I will have to place it on the uh, light microscope. I have placed the sample that we prepared. Then we will have to first make sure that the specimen is in line with the lenses. So to do that, I can adjust the stage and make sure that the specimen is in the correct place. So by looking at it also, you can adjust it. Then as you know, there are more than one lenses. Those are the objectives with different powers. You all know what power you should use first. Yes, it is the lowest power and that has the shortest length. So with the lowest power, I will have to use the coarse adjustment now. So I will look through the slide and try to move the lens so that I can see the onion peel. Now that I have adjusted the lens, I have, I can see the slight shape of outline of the cells. Here the cells are different from the previous specimen. Here the cells look polygonal in shape. You all also can see it clearly. The cells are polygonal in shape. They do have sharp edges. Those are the cell walls. But this is not clear enough. So what I will do is I will change the power to a higher power so that we can observe it even more clearly. Now I will change the power of the lens. It is a high power lens and I'll use the fine adjustment knob. So when I move the fine adjustment knob, now I can see as you do, you also can see the specimen clearly. You can see the polygonal shaped cells and you can see a distinct boundary at the cells a thick boundary which you did not see in the previous specimen. Okay students, now that you have observed the two samples clearly, what are the differences you saw between the cheek cell and the plant cell here? The cheek cells, they were spherical in shape, whereas this specimen that is the onion peel has cells with a, which are polygonal and kind of elongated in shape. And also here we can see a more, more broader outer line that you will learn as the cell wall of the cells that was absent in the cheek cells. So those are the two main differences that you observe the shape of the cells were different. So that means the animal cell or the cheek cell is different from the plant cell that is the cells in the onion pea. So with this you have a good understanding about how cells vary in different types of organisms. In animals and plants there are different types of cells because they vary in shape and size. Okay students, now you all observe the 
cells that were present in an onion peel very clearly. Can you all remember the shape of the cells? When we moved the specimen around, you were able to observe the cells clearly. And first we observed the cheek cells. You all were able to understand and identify that the onion peel cells were different from the cheek cells. Why? The onion peel contains cells like this. Rectangle shaped and they were arranged in different layers. So this was the way you observe the onion peel. So here you can observe an outer layer which is somewhat thick compared to the outer layer that you saw in the cheek cell specimen. So this layer will be the cell wall of the plant cell. And here again you were able to observe the nucleus. But unlike the nucleus in the cheek cell, here the nucleus was towards a side. It was towards the side of a cell, somewhere towards the sides. Or we can say the periphery of the cell. Periphery means the outermost layer of the cell, closest to that. So that was the nucleus. You were able to observe that as well. So students, when we observe the cell under the microscope, you can only see a few structures, especially under the light microscope. But if we look at it and observe it under the electron microscope, then we will be able to see all the structures that are present in a cell. But as we discussed before, there are different types of cells in different shape and size. Because of this variation, we cannot have a cell in nature with all the structures and organelles present in it. Depending on its function and size, each cell will have certain number of organelles and different types of organelles. But if we make a model that contains all the organelles and structures that are possible in a cell, then we call it a typical cell. So the typical cell, the cell prepared by including all the organelles is known as the typical cell. In the living world, such cells do not exist. The reason is these students. Now if we take a plant, the leaves have a certain function. They do photosynthesis. So in a plant leaf, there is a structure called the chloroplast. But the roots do not do photosynthesis. Therefore, the chloroplast will be absent in the root cell. But there are some functions that are common to both the leaf and the root system. So therefore, there will be different organelles present in the plant cell, in different parts of the plant and also in different numbers and sizes. So what we do is we have a cell, we prepare a cell, in that we include all the parts. When we did the activity, we observed that there is a cell wall in the plant cell. And in that there will be a space which is called the vacuole. We will be discussing all the organelles after this. So there that will have a certain structure. Then there will be a nucleus. 
then there will be a chloroplast that has a certain structure then there are organelles that are there to produce energy and in the cytoplasm scattered here and there there will be many other organelles and since the number of organelles and the size and the shape of cells vary based on the function we need to study the cells using a typical cell now this cell is made by gathering information of cells observed under light microscope and electron microscope so let us first look at the diagrams of the animal and plant cells that are visible through light microscope animal and plant cells seen through a light microscope so here you can see this is an animal cell and these are plant cells so you can compare this with what we saw through the light microscope when we use the cheek cell sample and the onion peel so here also you can see the animal cells have a spherical like shape and in this you can see the cell membrane or what we can call as the plasma membrane another name is plasma membrane that is this first structure that is like the boundary around each cell that is the outermost layer of an animal cell and in all the cells you can see the nucleus a dark black color structure that is the nucleus of the cell and it is present in all the cells and within the cell the rest of the area contains the cytoplasm this as i told you all is a gelatinous structure and in this gelatinous cytoplasm all the organelles are embedded and they perform different functions but under the light microscope we can't observe any other organelles or structures you can just see them present in the cytoplasm but we can't identify them if we compare this animal cell with a plant cell here you can see the plant cell has like a polygonal shape it can be either rectangular shape like we observed in the onion peel or polygonal shape cells like this and in this around the cell each of the cell has two layers of boundary so that is a special feature that is not present in the animal cell here we can see a cell wall cell wall is the outermost boundary of the plant cell so it's absent in animal cells and inside the cell wall you can see the cell membrane but in this truck diagram the cell membrane is not visible and within the cell again we can see the nucleus that is the dark black color spherical shaped structure but in this the nucleus is almost centralized it's in the center but here the nucleus has been pushed towards the periphery the reason is this large structure this is the central vacuole there is no central vacuole in the animal cell but because of this the plant cell has the nucleus pushed towards the side and also the cytoplasm 
this part where you see like black color spots. So that area is the cytoplasm that is also pushed towards the periphery. So this part is the cytoplasm. So remember students, when we observe the plant and animal cells through the light microscope, there are only a few structures visible to us in the animal cell, cell membrane, nucleus and the cytoplasm. In a plant cell, cell wall, nucleus, the central vacuole and also the cytoplasm. And the animal cell does not have a cell wall or a large central vacuole. Now let us see how these cells will look like under a, an electron microscope image. Typical plant cell created based on electron microscopic information. So this is a typical cell that means it has all the structures that can be present in a plant cell. And this is made using electron microscopic information. Now let us look at the different structures and the organelles present in it. As I said before, the outermost layer is the cell wall. So here the cell wall is shown to you all. This is the outermost layer. So that is like the wall or the boundary of a cell. Inside that there is the cell membrane. Cell membrane is marked here. So here we have the cell membrane. Another name for cell membrane is plasma membrane. So we can call it the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. So those are the two outer layers of a plant cell. Then on this side you can see the structure that is the nucleus. It has different parts. Now this side which look, looks like a tubular structure and has foldings that is the envelope. We call it the nuclear envelope. So this is the nuclear envelope. And inside the nucleus, you can see this circular structure that is the nucleolus. Nucleolus. And within the nucleus, you can see these thread-like or fiber-like structures. Those are the chromatin fibers or the chromatin body. And you all know students, we have discussed these before. The nucleic acids are the chromatin fibers. So they are present within the nucleus. The nuclear envelope and the nucleolus together is known as the nucleus of the cell. Then you can see the large structure that also has a membrane around it and it takes up most of the space. And this membrane is known as the tonoplast. So this structure is the central vacuole that is covered by a membrane called the tonoplast. And inside the central vacuole, there is water and minerals. All together, that is known as the cell sap. So this part is the cell sap. Together, the cell sap and the tonoplast are the central vacuole. So because the central vacuole takes up a large space, the cytoplasm has been 
push towards the periphery or it's visible and present only in the periphery. So here we can identify the cytoplasm. This is the arrow pointing to the cytoplasm and the rest of the organelles are present in, in the cytoplasm. So let us look at each of the structure. Now these small dots that are shown at the top corner are called the ribosomes. Then we have these structures like a tubular structure with dots at the surface. So it looks like a rough surface and that is known as the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So if there is a rough endoplasmic reticulum, there will be a smooth endoplasmic reticulum as well. Here on the sides you can see smooth structures which are tubular in nature. They are known as smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Then this structure which looks like a rod but in between there are plate like structures. This is a chloroplast and this is specific only to plant cells. The cell wall, chloroplast and the large central vacuole are only present in plant cells. You cannot see them in an animal cell. Then this structure again like a rod but you can see in the middle there is a membrane folding. That is how you can identify this structure. This is called the mitochondria. If we say mitochondria that is many. If it's only one then we call it the mitochondrion. And here we have another structure. This is also a sac-like structure. It's like sacs arranged on top of each other. You can imagine this like a stack of plates or saucers arranged one on top of the other. And at the ends you get vesicles. This structure is called, called the Golgi complex. So now we have labeled all the structures and organelles present in a typical plant cell. Let us move on to the animal cell. Typical animal cell created based on electron microscopic information. So before and as we discussed before, you can't see a cell wall around this cell. So cell wall is absent in an animal cell. So the outermost boundary is this line. This is a membrane and it's called the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. So let us mark that first plasma membrane or cell membrane. And here you can see unlike the plant cell there is no large central vacuum. Therefore the nucleus is present almost centralized and also it's a very large structure. But the structure of the nucleus is the same. It has a nucleolus in the middle and it has the envelope which is called the nuclear envelope. And both these together is the nucleus. And like 
in the plant cell. Here also you can see this chromatin fiber or chromatin body. Around the nucleus you can see this tubular folded structure with dots on it. That again is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So here we can see the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And below that you can see the structure. It's familiar to you all. It was present in the plant cell. What is it students? Yes. It is the mitochondrion, a rod-shaped structure with folded membrane in the middle. Mitochondrion. Again, we have some more structures. This is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Again, tubular structures but no spots on the surface. So we call it the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Then you can see another structure here. Now initially when you look at these two structures, they look slightly alike. But remember students, when you understand the nature of the structures, you will not make a mistake. This is a tubular structure. Here you can see this is a folded membrane structure, but like, as I said before, like saucers or plates stacked together. So here you can see many plate-like structures arranged one on top of each other. And to the sides, you can see many circles, which are called the vesicles. So from that, you can identify this is a Golgi complex or a Golgi body. So this is a Golgi complex. Then we have some black colored dots on the cytoplasm. Those are the ribosomes. So here what you see as black dots are the ribosomes. And here again is the cytoplasm. This part is the cytoplasm. So we have labeled all the structures here. There is one more. This is called the centriole. This is again a small structure present in the cytoplasm of different cells. So they are known as centrioles. This is the centriole present in an animal cell. So now we have labeled all the structures present in a typical animal cell. Remember students, when you are given a diagram, you should be able to identify the organelles. For that, remember the structure clearly. And also you should be able to differentiate between a plant and an animal cell. Now let us discuss the difference between plant and animal cells. Differences between animal cells and plant cells. So I have written down the characteristics that are different between these two cells. The first one is the cell wall. Do you get a cell wall in the animal cell? No. So in an animal cell, cell wall is absent. But it is present in a 
plant cell. So in a plant cell, we get the cell wall. Then what did we see? There is a large vacuole in the plant cell. Therefore, the cytoplasm is towards the periphery. But in the animal cell, we get a large area of cytoplasm. So the next character is the cytoplasm. So in an animal cell, there is a large area or content of cytoplasm. But in the plant cell, present in the periphery of the cell. The next one is the large central vacuole. In an animal cell, we don't get that, but instead there can be small vacuoles. So here, no large vacuole, small vacuoles can be present. If we take the plant cell, there is a large vacuole present. Then the last structure, that is again a very important difference. There is chloroplast in the plant cell, but it is absent in animal cells. So here chloroplast is absent. And in a plant cell, it is present. So students, with this, now you are very familiar with the structure of both the plant and animal cells. And you all know how it looks like under the light microscope and electron microscope. So let us now discuss the different types of organelles present in the cell and their functions. Cell organelles and structures present in a cell. Every organelle and structure present in a cell perform a specific function. You have to understand this term specific function. The cell shows a division of labor. If we consider some examples, there is the nucleus in the cell. This controls the functions of the cell. Controls the functions of the cell. Another organelle, the mitochondrion. If we take the mitochondrion, aerobic respiration takes place in the mitochondrion. These are cell organelles that are common to both animal and plant cells. If we take the chloroplast that is present only in the plant cell. Now let's say the chloroplast. This does photosynthesis. So here you can see students, the nucleus controls all the functions. It cannot do photosynthesis. Whereas the chloroplast cannot control the functions of the cell. In a similar manner, the mitochondrion cannot do any of the other functions. That is what we mean by division of labor. Different organelles and different structures are present to carry out the separate functions. With that, 
we will move on to the next one. The first one is the cell wall. As you can see, this is the structure of the cell wall and that is the outermost covering of the plant cell. So here we have to remember the cell wall is present in a plant cell only and it is absent in animal cells. So that is the outermost covering. Therefore, it acts like a wall. Then you know the structure and the function of a wall. It protects. So here also the cell wall protects the cell. It gives a shape to the cell and it gives a structure to the cell. The cell wall is a dead structure. So it is a dead structure. The cell is living but the cell wall is a dead structure. The main constituent of it is cellulose. I am sure students you all know what cellulose is. It is a polysaccharide. One of the biomolecules is carbohydrate and in that cellulose is a polysaccharide and it is the main constituent of the cell wall. Main constituent. The main functions of the cell wall are to maintain the shape of the cell, support and protection of the cell. So as I told you, since it's like the wall, it maintains the shape and provides protection. And also it provides support. Support in order to contain the cytoplasm and all the organelles within a certain area. Now we we'll look at the next structure, the plasma membrane also known as cell membrane. Here you can see in a cell, this is an animal cell, the outermost covering is the plasma membrane. But if it is a plant cell, it is the second layer. Outermost is the cell wall, then the cell membrane is the second layer. Plasma membrane is present interior to the cell wall of plant cells. The boundary of the animal cell is the plasma membrane. It is made up of phospholipids and proteins. I am sure you all know what protein is. It is one of the biomolecule and the other molecule is phospholipid. So when a phosphate group combines with lipids, it forms phospholipids. So those two are the main constituents. Here you can see this is a detailed structure of the cell membrane and all these molecules are phospholipids and proteins. We are not going to go into detail about the membrane structure. Plasma membrane is a semi-permeable membrane. This is something you have to remember. The cell wall in plant cells allows all the substances to enter the cell. But the plasma membrane or the cell membrane is selective in allowing substances to enter the cell and to go out of the cell. So therefore we call it semi permeable. It allows water, some ions to go in and out of the cell. But it does not allow certain materials to enter the cell or to go out of the cell. That is why we call it semi permeable. Another name is selectively permeable or selective permeable. 
and therefore the main function of the cell membrane is to enclose the cell in an animal cell that is the outermost boundary to allow entry of water, ions and some molecules and thereby control the entry and exit of materials into and out of the cell. So it allows water, ions and some molecules only to pass in and out of the cell. And finally, the plasma membrane is also known as cell membrane. So both refer to the same structure. Then we have the cytoplasm. So both in plant cells and animal cells inside the cell membrane or the plasma membrane, we have the cytoplasm, the gelatinous liquid part of the cell excluding organelles. So we take out the organelles and only the remaining gelatinous part is known as the cytoplasm. Both inorganic and organic substances are present in it. I am sure you can remember from the first lesson what organic and inorganic compounds are. Organic, the compounds that have carbon. Inorganic, the compounds that do not have carbon. With the exception of the oxides, carbonates and bicarbonates of carbon. The functions of the cytoplasm are to maintain the shape of the cell. Now in an animal cell, although the outer covering is the cell membrane, if there is nothing there to fill the space, then the membrane will shrink. So when there is a cytoplasm, it pushes the membrane out and maintains the shape. Bare cell organelles. So as you can see here, all the organelles are embedded in the cytoplasm. Carry out different metabolic processes. We have discussed metabolic processes before. Any chemical process, any activity that takes place within a living cell is known as a metabolic process. The structures submerged in the cytoplasm are named organelles. We have discussed this before and you have labeled all the organelles present in a plant cell and an animal cell. And out of these organelles, some organelles are surrounded by cell membranes. We have the cell membrane, the plasma membrane and some of the organelles are surrounded by it. The mitochondrion, nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi complex are organelles that are surrounded by membrane but we have the ribosome which does not have a membrane so ribosome there is no membrane all these structures are present in the cytoplasm let us look at the first organelle that is the nucleus in both plant and animal cells there were distinct nucleus. But in the plant cell, it was pushed towards the periphery. In the animal cell, it was centralized. And here you can see the structure of a nucleus. It has a nucleolus and also it has chromatin fibers inside and it has a nuclear envelope. Nucleus is the main organelle in a cell. It is surrounded by a nuclear envelope. One or two nucleolus. So you can have one or two nucleolus and the chromatin body are present inside the nucleus. So if I just denote the structure of a 
nucleus it will be something like this the nucleolus and we have the nuclear envelope and the chromatin fibers body or chromatin fibers so this is how you can represent a nucleus in a line diagram a simple manner if you are asked to draw it and during the cell division the chromatin body converts into chromosomes so here the chromatin body looks like thin thread they look like fibers but before a cell divides they become very prominent and they are visible through the microscope so that is what is meant by chromatin body converts into chromosomes but it's the same structure the functions of chromosomes are the storage of genetic material and transfer inherited characters from generation to generation chromatin fibers which are made up of nucleic acids store and transfer genetic information from one generation to another generation and when they do that they contain all the information that is the genetic information related to each type of organism so therefore the number of chromosomes present in a cell is specific to species when we say species it is the specific type of organism it can be a plant animal or a microorganism and for example if we look at the human cell in a human being there are 46 chromosomes or we say there are 23 pairs of chromosomes but in a frog there are 26 chromosomes and in a paddy plant there are only 24 chromosomes and the main function of the nucleus is the control of life activities of the cell so as we saw before it is the main organelle in a cell because that controls all the other functions that are carried out by all the other organelles let us move on to the next organelle mitochondria it is an oval or rod shaped membrane bounded organelle so here you can see this is the rod shape and from this folded membrane structure as you can see in both the pictures you can easily identify the mitochondria so it's a membrane bounded organelle and aerobic respiratory reactions takes place within the mitochondria to release energy as i told you all before mitochondrion refers to one and mitochondria refers to many an aerobic respiration takes place here aerobic means in the presence of oxygen so during that respiration lot of energy will be released and this energy is supplied to the rest of the organelles and the cell it is known as the power house of the cell so this name power house because it supplies energy to all the other parts of the cell the energy produced within the mitochondrion is used for the metabolic activities of the cell we'll move on to the next one golgi complex membrane bounded sacs stacked one on top of the other with associated secretory vesicles are collectively known as golgi complex 
So here you can see this diagram. These are the membrane bound sacs. So these are the sac like structures. They are stacked one on top of the other. As I mentioned before, this looks like a pile of saucers or plates kept one on top of the other. You can confuse this with a endoplasmic reticulum. So to differentiate, you have to look at the shape and also you can see that there are many vesicles. These are the, these are the membrane bound stacks. And these circular shapes are the vesicles. So from the presence of these vesicles, you can easily identify and distinguish Golgi complex from endoplasmic reticulum. The functions of Golgi complex is the production of secretory substances, packaging, and secretion. So within these sacs, different substances which need to be secreted by the cell are produced and they are packed and then they are secreted out. So that will be given to the different parts of the cell. Next one is the ribosome. So we discussed before ribosome does not have a membrane. They are small organelles without a membrane. So remember students, this is the organelle that does not have a membrane surrounding. It is made up of two units, a large subunit and a small subunit. Here you can see there is no membrane and the subunits, the large one and the small one. They can be found freely in the cytoplasm. If you can remember when we looked at the different cells, both plant and animal, inside the plant cell, like here in the cytoplasm, there were small dots. Those were the ribosomes. Similarly, we found ribosomes in the animal cells as well. And also, they can be attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. When we saw the rough endoplasmic reticulum like this around the nucleus, you saw that there were ribosomes attached to the surface. So these are the free ribosomes. These are the ribosomes attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. The function of it is the protein synthesis. Here in the second diagram, you can see these are the two subunits, the large and the small subunit. And this is the amino acid chain that is being synthesized. You can remember from the first lesson, amino acid is the basic structural unit of proteins. When they are combined together, different types of proteins are made. And that is done by this ribosome molecule. The next one is endoplasmic reticulum. It is an intermembranous network made up of flat or tubular sacs within the cytoplasm. So here you can see the two diagrams given to you. These are the tubular structures. They are folded tube-like structures or flat tube-like structures. So it is an intermembranous network and the endoplasmic reticulum is of two types. One is the rough endoplasmic reticulum which has ribosomes present on the surface and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum which does not have ribosomes on the surface. So here you can see rough endoplasmic reticulum because of the presence of ribosomes. And the function of rough endoplasmic reticulum is the transportation of proteins within the cell. 
we discussed in the previous slide ribosomes carry out protein synthesis so the ribosomes that are attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum synthesize protein and that is transported by this structure so if we look at the smooth endoplasmic reticulum it is a network of tubular sacs without ribosomes on the membrane so here you can see another structure that does not have ribosomes on it here this one is a rough endoplasmic reticulum because you can see the ribosomes on it this also has the ribosome but this part is very smooth the surface is very smooth because there are no ribosomes and this carries out synthesis of lipids steroids and to transport them within the cell are the functions of it so the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is involved with the synthesis of lipids and steroids so overall both endoplasmic reticulum are involved with transporting substances rough transports proteins and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum transports and also synthesizes lipids and steroids the next one is the vacuole it is a fluid filled large organelle found in plant cells which is surrounded by a membrane so here a structure of a large central vacuole is shown to you if you can remember in the plant cell there was this large central vacuole and this is in a plant cell in this the outer membrane was given a special name the membrane that surrounds the vacuole is known as the tonoplast and what is contained within the vacuole it is called the cell sac you can see that in this diagram as well this is the tonoplast the outer membrane and inside there is cell sac the fluid contained in it is known as the cell sac water sugar ions and pigments store within the vacuole so the main solvent or the constituent is water in that sugar ions and pigments pigments are particles that can be responsible for color or other functions so these are all present in the cell sac in animal cells generally no vacuoles are found sometimes small vacuoles may be present so when we looked at the typical cell of an animal we saw that there was no central vacuole but there can be small vacuoles present contractile vacuoles can be found in unicellular organisms contractile means they can reduce in size they can contract and expand a little bit these types of vacuoles are found in unicellular organisms the functions of the vacuole are maintaining water balance as i said before the cell sac contains water so if the cell the cytoplasm needs water water from the vacuole can go into the cell if there is excess amount of water then that water can be stored within the vacuole as cell sac so that means it maintains the water balance it provides support because this is a large structure and with the cell sac it will become a somewhat rigid structure so that provides a support to the cell 
and provision of color to the cell by the pigments within it. So as we saw here, inside the vacuole, there are pigments and these pigments are colored and that provides a color to the cell. So that is the vacuole. Now we have discussed all the different types of organelles. Let us try to identify them in this cell diagram. So you all can identify it first and thereafter you can see whether you have identified them correctly. We'll start off with this, the first arrow that is pointing to the blue color area which is spread all throughout the cell. So that is the, what is it? It is the cytoplasm. So the first one is the cytoplasm. Next one is this boundary. What do you think students? Is this a plant cell or an animal cell? Yes, it is an animal cell. Why? You can't see a large central vacuole here and the nucleus is there. It is a centralized nucleus and also this outermost boundary is only one layer. That means it is the cell membrane. So therefore this is an animal cell. So we have identified this as the animal cell. And here this is the cell membrane. And what do we have here? You can look at the shape, a rod shape and inside there is a membrane, a folded membrane. That is the mitochondria. So I hope you identified it correctly. Then the next one, you can see this whole structure is the nucleus. And the outer layer of the nucleus is known as the nuclear envelope and inside this is pointing to the chromatin fiber and also within the nucleus normally there is a nucleolus. So here this part is the nuclear envelope. We can't see the nucleolus in this structure so I will mark this as the chromatin body. Everything together is the nucleus. And around the nuclear envelope, what can you see? It's a tubular membrane structure. So that is the endoplasmic reticulum. And here you can see the ribosomes on the surface. So this is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is another structure that is seen in the cytoplasm of the cell. What is that? Small dot like structures. So those are the ribosomes. And finally we have this structure. You can identify this easily. How? Again these are membrane sacs stacked on top of each other and around them you can see the vesicles. So that means this is the Golgi complex. So students, now after discussing all the different types of organelles, 
present in plant and animal cells. You are able to identify the different organelles present in a cell. Like this, if you are given a plant cell, you should be able to identify that it is a plant cell and also you should know to identify all the organelles present. So with this, we have come to the end of the discussion on structure of cells. But as we discussed before, these are the basic structural and functional unit of all organisms. So if it is a multicellular organism, then there should be many cells. And from the cell theory, you all know that new cells are formed from pre-existing cells. So let us discuss cell division and cell growth. Cell growth and cell division. So students, now we have discussed the structure and the organelles present in a cell. We are moving on to this topic, cell growth. Now in any cell, it can be a unicellular organism or a multicellular organism that is a plant or an animal cell. There are many different organelles and structures present and they have specific functions. And if you can remember the cell theory, new cells are formed from pre-existing cells. Now when these new cells form, the structures and organelles present in a cell are not 100% developed. So then we call the cell an immature cell. You can look at this picture. In this cell, the organelles are there. The nucleus is there. There are small vacuoles. You can see the green color structures. Those are the chloroplasts. And also you can see there is a cell membrane and a cell wall. So from that you can identify this is a plant cell. But if you compare this plant cell with the cell that we discussed, this looks a bit different. Why? The organelles are arranged in a different manner. Small vacuoles, nucleus is in the center and the cytoplasm is distributed throughout. So that cell cannot do its function to the maximum. Then what happens is they start growing. There the size of the cell increases. All the organelles and the structures get arranged properly. And also the dry mass of the cell increases. Then the cell becomes mature cell. Here you can see this cell is a plant cell that you can immediately identify. Why? There is a large central vacuole. Cytoplasm is towards the periphery of the cell. Nucleus is in the periphery of the cell and all the other organelles are present. And the size is large. So one main change that occurs when a cell grows is the increase in size of the cell. That is not all. If you can remember, we have discussed previously about wet mass and dry mass. If you look at a living organism, the body of a living organism contains lot of water. Because of that, the mass that is obtained from a living organism is called the wet mass. If there is no water, only the components are present except water, then we call that mass as the dry mass. Why do we need to consider dry mass? Because the amount of water present in a living organism can change a little bit. 
you know on say a rainy day the plant gets enough water so it will contain lot of water inside the structure but on a very hot day a sunny day there is lot of vaporization taking place so then the amount of water in a plant will be less so if you weigh the plant on two different days the mass will be different but if you consider the plant without any water then we call it the dry mass that will not depend on the type of day or whether there is enough water or not so then that is a fixed mass that is the reason here we consider the dry mass this cell without water has a dry mass and the mature cell without water has a dry mass and the dry mass increases irreversibly when a cell grows so now if we look at the explanation for cell growth growth of a cell is the irreversible increase of size or dry mass so you cannot go back to the immature state once the cell grows to its mature stage okay so the cell grows that you can understand how did the immature cell come into form because the cells that were there divided and formed new cells so now let us see how cells divide cell division the cell division is the process by which new cells are formed by the division of cellular materials so when we say cellular materials we consider all the structures and the organelles and everything that is present in a cell so for example if we take an animal cell there is a central nucleus and the cytoplasm is there so this cell that is already there is known as a mother cell and this is a mature cell now the mature cell has reached the maximum size so it cannot grow any further then the cell will have to divide so when it divides what will happen is all the cellular materials all the components here and even the nucleus has to divide but when that happens the nucleus doesn't just divide into half it actually multiplies and all the organelles and the cytoplasm is divided to the new cells that are formed so when that happens the cell that is formed new will be very tiny compared to the mother cell that is why those cells have to grow that we discussed before and when we say multiplication from the mother cell new daughter cells are formed the cells that are formed from the mother cell are known as daughter cells and this happens like a multiplication from one cell two cells are formed then from these two cells there are four new cells form and from the four new cells there are eight new cells so here there is from the four cells there are eight new cells form so here you can see 
from the mother cell two cells then from the two cell four from four it becomes eight so that is why we say it multiplies and forms new cells the cell division is the process by which new cells are formed by the division of cellular material and as i said before when the cell divides the nucleus divides first then the rest of the cell divides so it's always the nucleus that divides first nucleus divides first then the cytoplasm along with the organelles it divides and the new cells are formed now let us see how this cell division really occurs so to complete the cell division of an eukaryotic cell first the nucleus should divide and then the cytoplasm here there is a new term eukaryotic cell eukaryotic means a cell that has an organized nucleus so here from the term eukaryotic it means cell with an organized nucleus so here you can see students this is a cell that has an organized nucleus we have discussed the structure of nucleus what are the structures or parts of a nucleus it has a nuclear envelope to which the endoplasmic reticulum is connected and inside the nucleus there is a nucleolus and the important components here are the thread like chromosomes or what we call as chromatin structures chromatin body so they look like a thread in a normal mature eukaryotic cell the appearance of chromosomes in an ordinary cell before the division of the nucleus if you look at any cell in our body or the body of a plant or an animal inside the nucleus the chromatin body will look like this thread like structure but before it divides because the nucleus has to divide first and also the chromatin fibers contain all the genetic information that is necessary for the structure and function of a body of an organism therefore this chromatin fiber has to become prominent so here you can see the appearance of chromosomes in a dividing cell so the thread like structure here has now become very very prominent so in that you will be able to identify the pairs of chromosomes you all know students in a human body cell there are 23 pairs of chromosomes and this number is specific to each species we have 23 pairs different species have different number of chromosomes so if this was a human cell then there will be very prominent 23 pairs of chromosomes then only the nucleus will divide so the rest of the structures are also present the cytoplasm nucleus and here you can see 
sister chromatids in a chromosome. When we say sister chromatids, they are pair of chromatids that is part of the chromosome when it becomes very prominent. Now first we will discuss how these chromosomes will divide. The number of chromosomes in an ordinary somatic cell of a species is constant. I mentioned this a little while ago. Somatic cell is a constant. When we say somatic cell, the cells present in the body of a living organism that is not involved in reproduction are known as somatic cells. And you can remember the cells that are involved in reproduction are known as gamete cells. So in living organisms, there are somatic cells and there are gamete cells. So in a somatic cell, the number of chromosomes is a constant. So for example, if we take human somatic cell. How many chromosomes are there? There are 23 pairs of chromosomes. So this has 23 pairs or we can say 46 chromosomes. And this has to be maintained constant for a species. That means when a child is born, the child also should have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes. When the body grows, when the number of cells increase, all the cells in the body should have 23 pairs or 46 chromosomes. So that means when there is growth, the number of chromosomes have to be maintained constant. And when there is production of new organisms, that is the reproduction process, then also the number of chromosomes have to be maintained constant. In order to do this, there are two types of cell division based on how the number of chromosomes change or don't change. Let us look at those two types. Before we go to that, I will introduce a new term, homologous pair of chromosomes. A pair of chromosomes which contains same hereditary information is called as homologous chromosomes. So we said in a human somatic cell, there are 23 pairs. Each pair is a homologous pair of chromosome. So if we let's say take the first pair, this is the first pair. In this different parts, now let's say these two parts that I have marked are responsible for the character of your Hair. So both chromosomes will contain information regarding to the nature of hair. Similarly, there will be different positions in the chromosome that are responsible for different characteristics. That is what we say same hereditary information. So then it is a homologous pair of chromosome. Homo means same. So homologous pair of chromosomes. And one of these homologous chromosomes is inherited from father and the other is from the mother. So here this one here comes from the father and the other one from the mother. And when they both combine and the child will get a homologous 
pair of chromosomes. Where there is a pair of chromosomes. Like this, there will be 23 pairs of chromosomes. So, there will be 23 pairs. So, that means from the father, the child will get 23 chromosomes and from the mother, the child will get 23 chromosomes. So, from the mother, 23 chromosomes and from the father also, 23 chromosomes. Twenty-three chromosomes and twenty-three chromosomes combine and form twenty-three pairs. And when the child grows, the twenty-three pairs have to be maintained throughout the body. That is why when gametes are formed, there is a type of cell division taking place. And when the child grows, there is another type of cell division taking place. So now we will discuss what those two types are. The cell division takes place in two methods. One method is mitosis. In mitosis, the number of chromosomes are maintained. The number of chromosomes are maintained. That means if there are 23 pairs, the new cells also will have 23 pairs. If there are only 23, then the new cells will have only 23. The second type is meiosis. In this, the number of chromosomes becomes half. So here, the number of chromosomes become half. So for these two to happen, there are two types of cells. In one type of cell, there are pairs of chromosomes. For example, if we take the somatic cell of a person, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. Then we call these types of cells as diploid cells. You know, di means two. So diploid is the chromosomes being paired. And because of that, we denote this cell as 2N. But the gamete cells of the person has only 23 chromosomes. It has only 23 chromosomes. Then we call this as a haploid cell. No pairs, unpaired chromosomes. And this is known as a haploid cell. And this haploid cell is denoted by N. So here there are no pairs, only single chromosomes. In a person, the gamete cells are haploid cells. Whereas the rest of the cells, those are the somatic cells, have paired chromosomes and they are known as diploid cells and the number of pairs is 
23 pairs. Now if we go back to the two types of cell division. In mitosis, the number of chromosomes are maintained. That means if this happens to be a 2N cell, the new cells will also be deployed, that is 2N. Or if it occurs in a haploid cell, the new cells will also be haploid. That is what we mean by the number of chromosomes are maintained. But in meiosis, this can only take place in diploid cells. Why? The number of chromosomes become half. So if it was 2n, it can become n. From diploid, a haploid cell will be formed. Not one, but more than one haploid cells will be formed. From one mother cell, there will be four haploid cells. We will discuss that a little later. But here you have to remember the meiosis. The second type of cell division can only take place in diploid cells because the number of chromosomes become half. So always 2N becomes N. This cannot happen in a haploid cell because the number of chromosomes cannot become half in that. So students, now you have a brief understanding about the two types of cell divisions. Let us look at these divisions and discuss them in more detail. Mitosis. This is the first type of cell division. It is the type of division which multiplies the number of cells by maintaining a constant number of chromosomes in the cells. So here it is a division where the cells multiply but maintaining a constant number of chromosomes. So throughout the body, all the cells have to have the same number of chromosomes. Then of course, the cells have to divide by mitotic process or mitotic division. Now let us look at this mitosis process. Now here you can see this is a mother cell and it has 2N chromosomes. That means homologous pair of chromosomes and we call it as a diploid cell and the nucleus has the chromosomes and the chromosomes are very prominent. In the second step you can see the chromosomes become even more clear. They are very clearly visible. Why? The nucleus is going to divide first. And once the nucleus divides, both the daughter cells, you can see here from one mother cell, there are two daughter cells being produced. Both the daughter cells have 2N nucleus. That means they also have diploid nucleus. Homologous pair of chromosomes. So this is the mother cell and here you can see there is only one mother cell and from the one mother cell there are two daughter cells being produced. So there are daughter cells two daughter cells and all these cells are identical because they all have 2n number of chromosomes that is homologous pair of chromosomes and therefore they are all diploid cells. So from one mother cell two daughter cells and they are all identical. Identical to the mother cell and both the daughter cells are identical. 
and when the cell division takes place, the nucleus divides first and then the cytoplasm divides. So here you can see first the nucleus divides and then the cytoplasm divides to produce two identical daughter cells equal to mother cell. So that is the simple process of mitosis cell division. We are not going to go into further detail. Let us now consider the significance of mitosis. Significance of mitosis. The main thing you have to remember students, here if it is a diploid cell, the new cells are diploid. If it was a haploid cell, the new cells that are formed, that is the daughter cells, are also going to be haploid. And they are all going to be identical cells. So based on that only, the mitosis becomes significant. For the growth of multicellular organisms. So growth of multicellular organisms. In the body of a person or a plant or an animal, all the cells have to have the same number of chromosomes. So therefore, it has to divide by mitosis process. So when we grow, plants grow, animals grow, the cells divide by mitosis. As an asexual reproduction method, we have discussed the unicellular organisms, only one cell. So when they want to reproduce, they just divide into two. They are also the new organism, say from a bacteria. New bacteria cells are formed. Then they divide by mitosis. And just this division from one cell, new two cells. Or from one organism, two new organisms are formed is known as asexual reproduction. So here, asexual reproduction method. And the third one is wound healing and cell replacement. These are two different processes. Now say you have a cut in your hand, a wound. It heals after some time. The skin grows, covers it up. After a few days, you won't even know that there was a wound. That is possible because of mitosis cell division. The same way, the hair grows, the nails grow. And when we do our daily work, cells from the skin are lost. But new cells are formed. That is what we call as cell replacement. During that also mitosis takes place. So in all these processes, the main thing is the number of chromosomes are maintained. So those are the significance of mitosis. Now let us move on to the Next type of cell division, meiosis. Meiosis, the cell division that halved the number of chromosomes is the meiosis. So here the important thing is half the number of chromosomes. This is somewhat different from the mitosis cell division. Here you can see there is division 1 and division 2. And this is the mother cell. So here you can see the mother cell is diploid. It has to be diploid. It cannot be haploid. So it's 2N. There are pairs of chromosomes. They have only showed two pairs of chromosomes. And in the second stage, still it is the 
2n diploid cell. But here you can see the chromosomes are paired and also they look very prominent. They are very visible. Why? The nucleus will divide first. The chromosomes will have to divide and then the cytoplasm will divide. Then at the end of division 1, you can see from one mother cell, there are two new cells formed. And then these two cells have to again divide. That is division 2. There you can see from these two, there are two pairs of chromosomes here. In these, there is only one one chromosome. So that means from here when it comes to the last stage, the number of chromosomes have become half. From the diploid cell, haploid cells are formed. So here I will just write it down. From diploid cell, there are four haploid cells formed. Those are the daughter cells. So here, there is a diploid mother cell. First division takes place. Two new cells are formed. Second division takes place. Four new cells are formed. So from one mother cell, there are four daughter cells formed. The mother cell is diploid. The daughter cells are haploid. So the number of chromosomes have become half. That is the importance of meiosis. Another thing. You can see here the second division of meiosis is similar to the mitosis division. Already in this, the chromosomes have become half. So because of that, from the two cells, when the four cells are formed, it looks like a mitotic division. So first part of the division is very much different from the mitosis because from 2N, we get N cells. That is from diploid cells, we get haploid cells. But in the second division, from haploid cells, we get haploid cells. So that means this division, the second division, resembles the mitosis division. And in these students, you have to remember there is something called variation taking place. Because when the chromosomes are divided into half, there can be changes occurring in the chromosomes. So those changes are known as mutations or variations. Because of these variations, there are new types of characteristics formed and that leads to evolution. That is an important feature that is only seen in meiosis cell division, but not in mitosis cell division. Now let us look at some more features. The meiosis takes place during formation of gametes. We have discussed this before as well. When gametes form, that is when reproduction has to take place, a cell from the father and a cell from the mother have to combine to produce the new offspring. So for that, the two cells that come from the father and mother are known as gametes. And what comes from the mother is the egg cell and what comes from the father is the sperm cell. 
So this happens in higher organisms. Organisms in which the reproductive system is highly advanced and also the reproduction process is more complex. We call them as higher organisms. After the fusion of the gametes, the number of chromosomes of a species should be maintained constant. For that, the number of chromosomes should be halved during the formation of gametes and become N, that is haploid. Let me explain this in more detail to you all. Now say we have the mother and the father. Both of them have two N cells. And from the mother, it is the egg that is formed. And from the father, it is the sperm. Here they have N chromosomes. That is, there is meiosis taking place. And then what happens? The egg and the sperm combine and the offspring is produced. When egg and sperm combine, N and N combine together and there will be 2N chromosomes. So that will lead to the cell division and then the offspring or the child will grow. So there are the body of that offspring, the new organism that is produced will have 2N number of chromosomes. So as you can see here, the parents have 2N. It becomes N during production of gametes. And when the gametes combine, again the offspring has 2N chromosomes. So the number of chromosomes is being maintained throughout generations. The mother and father one generation, the offspring the next generation. That is what is given here. After the fusion of gametes, this is the fusion. Here you can see number of chromosomes of a species should be maintained constant. For that, the number of chromosomes should be halved during the formation of gametes and become N. So here I will include that as well. These are diploid cells. Then here it becomes haploid. And again after the fusion, we have diploid cells. Let us go into more detail about the significance of this meiosis cell division. During meiosis, structural changes occur in chromosomes. I explained this to you all before. In a homologous pair of chromosomes, there are different regions which contain information related to different characteristics. So these characters, if the information changes, the characteristic will change. That is what we say structural changes occur in chromosomes. Therefore, new variations or new characters appear in organisms and this is a very important phenomenon in evolution. So if we just summarize it, you have the chromosomes, there are structural changes, And these structural changes lead to variation. 
and the variation leads to new characters and that leads to evolution. So these are all very important and this is only seen in meiosis, not in mitosis. So significance of meiosis. Maintenance of the constant number of chromosomes from generation to generation. Because the gametes have half the number of chromosomes as the parents. So here maintain constant number of chromosomes from generation to generation. Variations that occur in chromosomes help in evolution. So variation is a, an important and useful process in evolution. Formation of new organisms and the existence of the birth. So with those significance of my meiosis, we have come to the end of discussion on cell division. Now let us look at the difference between meiosis and mitosis. We have discussed the two types. I am sure you have a good understanding. So first you all try to fill in this table. The difference between meiosis and mitosis. Then you can compare with my answer. In meiosis, how many number of divisions are there? There are two divisions. So here there are two divisions. But in mitosis, there is only one division. The type of cell in which the division takes place. Meiosis can take place only in diploid cells. Only in diploid cells. That is, if I write it here, 2N. But mitosis can happen in both haploid, that is N and diploid cells, that is 2N. The next character, variations. Variation occurs in meiosis. So here it occurs in meiosis. But in mitosis it does not occur. Due to variations, there are changes in chromosomes. This takes place. During meiosis. But there are no changes occurring in mitosis. So here there are no changes. The next one. Number of daughter cells. How many daughter cells are produced during meiosis? There are four daughter cells. So here four daughter cells. And how many are produced during mitosis? Two daughter cells. Chromosomes received by daughter cells. Only the 
half number of chromosomes are received. But in mitosis, the same number is received. Here, half the number. That means from 2n, the daughter cells become n. But in mitosis, same number. So if the mother cells are 2n, we get 2n daughter cells. And if the mother cell is n, we get n daughter cells. Nature of mother cell and daughter cell. In meiosis, each daughter cell is different from each other and they differ from the mother cell. Why? Because of variations and the changes in chromosome. So here they are all different. But in mitosis, the daughter cells are identical and they are similar to the mother cell. So here they are identical and similar to mother cell. So students with this you have got a good understanding about how the two types of cell divisions take place and why they are important to living organisms. And finally, you know the difference between mitosis and meiosis. With that, we have come to the end of discussion of this unit. Let us first look at a summary and then we can answer some Questions. Summary. The basic structural unit of the organism is the cell. So here it is the basic structural unit. The structural and functional unit of life is the cell. New cells are formed from pre-existing cells. All these three together is what? is contained in the cell theory as well. They are the structural and functional unit and new cells are formed from pre-existing cells. Different functions are performed by different organelles in the cells. We have discussed that the cell shows division of labor because there are different organelles present to perform different functions. All animal cells are surrounded by the plasma membrane or what we call as the cell membrane. Generally, the nucleus is present at the center of the cell. The area between nucleus and the plasma membrane is the cytoplasm. There are different organelles present in the cytoplasm. Example, mitochondrion, Golgi complex and endoplasmic reticulum. From the structure of an animal cell, we have discussed all these characters. Most of the cell organelles are present in both animal and plant cells. There are some cell structures that are absent in the animal cell. For example, a cell wall and chloroplast are absent in an animal cell but are present in a plant cell. And also the plant cell has a large central vacuole whereas the animal cell might have small vacuoles. And because of that, in a plant cell, the nucleus is pushed towards the periphery of the cell. But in an animal cell, the nucleus is almost centralized. But some organelles like cell wall, chloroplast, large central vacuole are present only in plant cells. The cellular structures 
that carry genetic information are the chromosomes in the nucleus. So the important components present or structures present in a nucleus are chromosomes because they carry genetic information. The cell growth is the irreversible increase of dry mass or the size of the cell. So here we discuss cell growth. The cell divides at a particular stage during the growth. When it grows to its maximum size, it cannot grow further, then it divides and the number of cells increase. The cell division takes place according to two methods. They are mitosis and meiosis. So we have discussed the process of mitosis and meiosis in detail and you all know the difference between the two types of divisions and why they are significant to the living birth. So with that we have finished the discussion on this unit. As I always tell you all, listen to the discussion, you get a good understanding, then read your textbook, then you understand it even more better and finally answer the questions. That is what we are going to do next. I will start off with the questions given in your textbook.